Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. I wanted to come on and do my March reads. I read a lot of books in the month of March. I guess technically I read 14 books or something. 13 or 14. Um, but I feel like I had a weird reading month because I read a lot of poetry. I listened to uh, quite a few audiobooks and also I had one graphic novel in there. So it didn't feel like I read a lot of books and I feel like I usually have a couple like solid novels that I really look back on and I, I know like those are the ones I really liked and enjoyed or read in a particular month. But this month it was, I didn't really have that so it was kind of all over the place. But I mean, I'm kind of, I'm still glad that I read a big, a large variety of books and I hope that you get some good recommendations from this video, maybe some new poetry <laughs> recommendations. And also, just before I start, quite a few of these I gave back to the library, so I will include a little photo as opposed to holding them up physically. But yes, thank you for watching and let's get into it. Actually, the first book I read in March, on the first day of March, was part of this uh, larger collection. So I have this set which is the complete works of Primo Levi and he is one of my favorite authors. Um, he was a very famous Italian Jewish author and he actually spent time in Auschwitz and out of this set I read the first proper like complete book uh, in this set and that is If This Is a Man and If This Is a Man was Levy's um, basically the first thing that he ever wrote and it was the first thing of his to be published and he started writing it while he was still in Auschwitz, like towards the end of his time there. And it's basically a very like straightforward, very uh, tragic and obviously very harrowing account of his time in the camp. And yeah, I there's not much to say about this because it's so deeply personal and it's so important to read, but not just important, but just yeah, just very raw and I was crying when I read it and I, I had a lot of notes on it and but even notes aside, like it's just kind of something that you read and kind of take in and sit with. It's not really something that you can like pick apart and analyze because it's just like his raw account of what happened there, what it was like and yeah, kind of a a crazy way to start off this video but that was the first book I read in March and I really recommend Primo Levi to anyone who hasn't checked him out and I really look forward to continuing with this entire collection. You see behind me there's two other volumes so this is just the first one and there's a couple other of his books in here and the other collections, the other sets in the collection also have his poetry, his various essays things like that. So highly recommend Primo Levi. Next, on a much lighter note, I listened to um, three Agatha Christie audiobooks this month. I was on like a big Agatha Christie Poirot kick and I watched basically all of the BBC Poirot adaptations. Yikes. Um, they're, they're really fun, but some of them are just really bad. <laughs> so it's, it's a big mix. But anyway, so along with those, I listen to some of the audiobooks and I'm just going in order um, in all of the Poirots. So I read the first couple uh, a few months ago and then this month I'm just trying to get my uh, Poirot list out of my notebook, but I can't quite find it right now. But yes, so I read the big four first, or listened to rather, and I hated it. It was so bad. It was so racist. Just full of like harmful stereotypes, which is like kind of, you know, common in Agatha Christie already. But in the big four, it was like the main plot. So I don't recommend that one. And I'm including it in this video so that people are warned and they can stay away from it if they would like. Though I, I some people really like the big four and I just... I don't know why, but anyway, so that was the big four. Then I listened to Peril at End House, which is, I think, like another favorite. Um, it was all right. Set in like Cornwall, I think. 
I think Cornwall, somewhere on the coast in England and there's a big country house and there's actresses involved and anytime there's like an actor or actress in uh, Agatha Christie they're usually like, suspicious so there we go and that one was meh I give that like three stars and then I listened to Lord, Lord Ed Edgware Dies oh my god that's so hard to say Lord Edgware Dies there we go uh, that one was pretty fun another actress acting um plot line um that one is i like set in london but another kind of like rich family living in an old house and obviously lord edgeware dies said it right that time um it's in the title so yes that's just my brief uh agatha christie interlude right there if you're interested in agatha christie uh, i would check these out obviously and I think I'll, I might do like some fun Agatha Christie videos. I'm just on like a big kick recently where I, I like watching them. I like reading them, even if they really annoy me sometimes. And next I read um, Lucky Jim by Kingsley Ami, Amis maybe? Kingsley Amis. I'll put it on the screen. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. He, I don't know if he passed away. I think he passed away, but he was a British author. Um... He's very famous, and his son is also an author, uh, Martin Amis Amis. I don't know how to pronounce the last name. But yeah, so Lucky Jim is kind of like a satirical uh, campus novel. It follows a bumbling, um, not professor, but I guess like lecturer at a, um, a college in... I want to say Wales or something somewhere in England it's rural but it's also kind of like stuffy it's not like Oxbridge but it's like one of those type of vibes like ivory tower um very kind of stuffy and removed from the rest of the world so we follow this uh guy um Jim who is kind of very fed up with his situation and he hates everyone around him he hates the professor he works for, his boss, the chair, and he hates um, a lot of his students and co-workers and he's very fed up with academia and he also is kind of like bumbling through a romance. So we see all of that. It was actually really funny to read. I thought the writing was really clever. Um, it's like just full of like insults, which is really interesting to say. Like. He'll be describing just a scene in a room. Like, for example, he goes to one of the professor's houses a lot because he's trying to suck up to him to get, like, um, to get a promotion, basically, or to not get fired. And he has to go to this kind of, like, idiot professor's gatherings at his house. And he's describing these gatherings, but it's it takes so long, like, physically on the page because it's just insult after insult after insult he's like insulting the way his nose looks and he's describing like the setup of the room um all the other characters and how how much they annoy him so it's it can either be very infuriating or very entertaining to read i found it entertaining some people might not like it um but yeah if you're a fan of campus novels i would definitely check this out i it kind of reminded me of panin by Nabokov and that's one of my favorite books that I've read I think like in the past couple years and while this one is not like written as cleverly as Nabokov or whatever it's it's still kind of in a similar vein where it's like a bumbling um academic just trying to get by and there's some goofy situations so that was Lucky Jim so next I have another physical book that I can show you which is a graphic novel um it's called Turkish Kaleidoscope it's by Jenny White who is an academic and I have some of her other books on my shelf over there. She writes about Turkey and it's illustrated by Ergun Gündüz, who I haven't heard of, but I guess he has some other uh, graphic novels. Uh, I don't read many graphic novels, but this one, I again, I know Jenny White and I know her work, so I wanted to check this out. And this is basically a historical account of the 1970s in Turkey, which was a very violent and turbulent time. Um, particularly on university campuses. So Jenny White herself in the 1970s, I believe, she studied in Turkey at Hacettepe University in Ankara and she witnessed this violence firsthand and therefore she was inspired to um, write this history and make it into a graphic novel. And we see the ways that students were pulled into left various leftist groups. There was like a million different leftist groups 
um, kind of like proto-fascist far-right groups that a lot of students were participating in as well. And unfortunately on college campus, a lot of people died. A lot of people um, were caught up in the fighting. And then it kind of ended with the 1980 uh, military coup in Turkey, which was a right-wing coup and which unfortunately led to a lot of uh, students and left-wing activists being imprisoned and tortured. So again, another heavy topic from this month, but this doesn't so much um, cover the 1980 coup, it kind of wraps up briefly with it, but it's mainly a, follows a couple characters in the 70s who are students and who are wrapped up in these various different political factions. Um, and also, I should say, this um, has a accompanying playlist on Spotify, also called Turkish Kaleidoscope. So you can listen to a lot of the political music from the time, uh, which I thought was really cool. I, um, I'm not an expert in graphic novels. I don't read many of them. So as far as like its value as a graphic novel or its quality as a graphic novel, I'm not sure. Um, I thought it was pretty good. I like I don't want to hate on it because I really support like this story being told and I want more people to read it so if you're interested in learning more a little bit more about Turkey um, definitely check this out like I really recommend it um, but that being said I think it could have been better I think that there's just not much of a story like it's a little bit uh, limited in its scope and I I don't know like for me, there was no new historical information, so I didn't necessarily say like, wow, that's so interesting, I didn't know that. But I'm more just like, I appreciate that this exists. Like, I'm really happy that this exists. Um, that being said, if this sounds like something that you'd be interested in, definitely check it out. Like, there's definitely a lot of history to be learned in this. And um, yeah, you might learn something new and you might even discover some new music that uh, you didn't know you would like. So yes, this is Turkish Kaleidoscope. Okay, again, another. I have another library book next. I read Assembly by Natasha Brown, which was uh, shortlisted for the Goldsmiths Prize. I thought it won it. I'm an idiot. It did not win it, but shut up. Anyway, um, I had seen this on Bookstagram, and it's a short little novella. Um, I actually really, really liked it. I thought it was really well written. I'm really glad that I picked it up. Uh, it follows a black woman living in London and she's kind of a young professional and she is uh you know very fed up with her workplace and she's facing this kind of stifling like um kind of corporate grind and she also uh, faces a lot of microaggressions or maybe I guess even macroaggressions at work and at the same time she's also in a relationship with a white man and he is kind of like from a posh background, very privileged. Um, and we briefly follow her as she goes to his family's like country house. Um, and it's not so much about like the plot, it's we get more of her like reflections as she's going about her day at work or at um, accompanying her boyfriend or even like in between when she's on her own. Uh, that being said, I thought it was so well written and like a lot of the sentences are still like in my head, I can remember them. And I I was really interested in the way that it described um, like bodies and like kind of like the physicality of what the narrator was feeling. Like you can really feel this, this like very claustrophobic uh, environment that she feels that she feels that she's in and you can really sense like the physicality of racism like she describes like the skin the flesh of the people around her she describes like the way that they eat and like the food goes down their gullet and while at the same time describing how she kind of feels trapped in her own body and she's just saying like she just wants to escape this like cycle that she's in um yes it's it's a it's very like descriptive and it really conveys like a lot of the themes that the book is trying to put get across too so i thought it was really well written i'm really excited to read whatever Nat natasha brown writes next and this is a definite recommend like it's a short book you can probably read it in one sitting uh yes that was assembly by natasha brown Next, I read a really interesting book that I randomly found in a used bookstore, but apparently it's really famous and I just didn't know about it. But it's uh, Pedro Paramo. It's by Juan Rolfo. And this is a um, like a Mexican classic, basically. And it's, I think, considered one of the first instances of 
magical realism. So it's said that Gabriel Garcia Marquez was really inspired by this book and he really loved this book. Um, yes, and I believe it's from the 1950s or 60s. Yeah, first published in 1955. So this book <laughs> was, again, I really, I really enjoyed the ideas in it and some of the imagery. And it's kind of like a disjointed uh, telling of this man who is dead and he's kind of a ghost and he comes to a ghost town, basically. That's like the premise in a nutshell. But the reason I'm kind of struggling to describe it is because this is like, it's not really like a linear book. Basically, it kind of just hops around to different little like vignettes. So we'll just see like these two characters interacting and then we'll see these two characters interacting and it jumps back and forth in time. So we jump to our narrator who's in the ghost town and then we also jump to his dad who is Pedro Paramo and he actually has come to this town to find his dad. And Pedro Paramo was kind of like a, like an almost mythical figure in town. Like he had a bunch of kids and he was like a big deal basically. Um, so basically in all of that interesting plot where we're just like jumping around between different times and characters, we get a lot of themes and exploration of like death and life after death, the way that people's identities or memories remain um in others like how people live on through others there's a lot of depictions which i really loved in this of souls and ghosts as they kind of like haunt this town and it's not really there's not really like a clear line between who's dead and who's not and you also don't really get, like learn that these people are ghosts until like a little bit later on in the book or you kind of get a sense that of who's dead as you read on. So there's kind of interesting depictions of like uh, people and their memories and their souls. And specifically, I was interested in um, the way that sound is used to represent ghosts. So like the ghosts in this town are often described through their sounds, like they like their laughs, their steps on the cobblestones as they echo out, um, the sounds of a fiesta that used to ring out in the town, etc. So it's a very, I would say, read this if you really like magical realism and you want to read a book for the writing, like if you want to get the, these like little lyrical interesting descriptions and you want to learn about the craft. That's why I would read this book personally, because the actual like narrative of it, like the plot of it is almost impossible to follow. I mean, maybe i'm just an idiot and i like missed something but this was so difficult to read like i had no idea what was going on like plot wise like i got a sense of like okay he's dead that's a ghost like oh wow that's a really poignant reflection on death but then i was like okay what's going on here <laughs> like who is who um yeah there's also like a million different characters and they're kind of hard to follow so in terms of recommendation i would just say like take what I said with a grain of salt and if you like magical realism you might just like find this amazing you might even be able to follow it better than I did but um if any of the things that I said read as like a come off like come off as like a red flag to you then maybe um uh, be warned before you uh tackle this book but that being said it's a classic so I guess everyone should read it but yeah this was Pedro Paramo and a really interesting read uh, for me this month Getting towards the end, uh, thankfully, <laughs> I feel like I have so many random books this month, but this was definitely the highlight of my month, and it was no surprise, it was Voices in the Evening by my favorite woman, Natalia Ginsburg. She's so amazing, and I love her even more with every book that I read, and I'm like, how is that even possible? Um, yes, so this is a really short book. It's a novel, and it follows a town a small Italian town uh, after World War II. And it basically follows um, these characters as they're living in the aftermath of World War II, going about their daily lives. And as they go about their daily lives, we get these uh, accounts of old memories of what happened before World War II, who this character was, who that character was, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we just get lots of descriptions of people's lives, um, their personalities, the things that they like, how they dress, and you really much get, you very much get the sense that you're kind of like wrapped up in this town gossip. 
and you're learning like you know who ran off with who who wanted to marry who um etc etc um but in all of these kind of reflections you get this very kind of tragic and very melancholic sense of like wow like the war has really changed everyone so much it's changed everything there's a recurring quote in this uh in this book which is why has everything been ruined and two characters say that quote and it kind of encapsulates what this book is trying to get across which is the ways that people felt like such a such a gaping emptiness after the war and how it changed people's lives for good not just like their circumstances but their emotional states and their relationships to each other but then after like even in the aftermath of this huge like gaping loss they kind of just went about their lives and they just you know kept going they kept visiting each other's houses having dinner parties going to the market etc so we get all of that in this book and we kind of get two generations like the older generation who um it was very much like active in the war maybe they fought in the war uh etc and then we get um at the end we get more of a representation of the younger generation who is reflected in our narrator elsa and she is also dealing with this emptiness and i guess uh melancholy um but hers is more kind of uh this feeling of like what do i do with my life how do i carry on and uh, she tries to marry this man, Tomasino, and he's a really interesting character as well. He has a beautiful quote in this where he talks about how he feels like his elders, like his older brothers and his father, who were very much active in the war and who are like talked about earlier in the book, he feels like they have lived everything, like they've already um, taken up all the vitality and all the life in the village and that there's none left for him and he feels like he's just their shadow. And I thought that was a really like poignant way of kind of wrapping up how how like generational trauma is passed down um, throughout families living in living in the aftermath of World War II and all kinds of really interesting and just really beautiful, very like melancholy reflections in this book. I could talk a lot more about this, but I would just say if this sounds like something you would like, if you don't mind a book that doesn't have a clear linear plot running through it. If you don't mind reading about mundane details or ordinary details of people's lives and you just want to like get to know some characters really well, I would highly highly recommend this book but also anything else that Natalia Ginsburg writes because I feel like this is really like indicative of her of the rest of her books because she just writes about regular people going about their lives but in that like even in those like really like seemingly dull details you get like so much emotion and you get all these reflections and you're like holy shit like <laughs> how did she like weave this emotional tale like how am i crying like i was just reading about what someone had for dinner like oh she's just so amazing and i have to resist the urge to like drop everything and just read all the rest of her books because i have to savor them i can't read them all at once i'm re i'm gonna be really sad when I've read all her books and there's none left, but I guess I can reread them. But yeah, this is uh, Voices in the Evening, five stars. Really good. Okay, I gotta like speed it up, but um, I'll really quickly talk about two of the poetry collections that I read this month, which were both freaking amazing. So one of them is um, Whereas by Laylee Long Soldier, and this one. It, well, it was a finalist for the National Book Award, but I've um, heard a lot of praises of this, and it's pretty famous, I think, now at this point. But yes, Lily Long Soldier is a, an Indigenous American author, and that's kind of like the her identity and also her uh, experiences as an Indigenous American are kind of the main topic of these poems. She A lot of these poems are framed as a response to President Obama's official i guess apology to um indigenous indigenous americans um yes so i thought that was a really interesting format and it kind of plays off of those words and that's kind of where uh, whereas comes from as well it's like involved in this kind of like legal language that she's playing off of and in that we also get some reflections on her identity and also her experiences as a mother so this was beautiful amazing five stars 
recommend this to everybody. And then next I read a uh, Time Regime, which was sent to me by the publisher and which is out on April 1st, I believe. And this is a debut poetry collection by the author and their name is Johnny Rontawa. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But I really love their poetry, their their lyric, like it's so, their words are so, mm, I don't know how to describe it because I'm like, I'm kind of a newbie with poetry. So apologies if I'm not the most articulate <laughs> when it comes to describing this. But I thought that the poet really did an amazing job of like, creating an atmosphere which sounds obvious but they really create this atmosphere through descriptions of like the material like they describe like raw materials they describe the earth they describe bodies um and also like industrial settings um read um some of the praise that's been written about this collection so in the beginning um there's like a lot of different blurbs that um other qualified poets have written and I, I highlighted some of the bits that I just feel like really describe it well but um, this person called it a record of experience and its ancestral inheritances through the ecologies that encompass them so that's a pretty good description I would say um, this person said the poems are a caravan of water ancestry and crossings which I thought was beautiful um, and then one more, this person described it as a palindrome of textures to be perceived both backward and forward at the same time. Yeah, just beautiful. So, oh, and this person said, composed with the diligence and precision of a cartographer. I thought it was really, <laughs> really poetic. Um, but yes, yeah, so basically just really beautiful. If you want to read some really beautiful writing, some get some really interesting perspectives, um, yeah like get some really beautiful descriptions of like raw materials which i really liked <laughs> uh, i would really really recommend this poetry collection it's called time oh my god did i even say what it's called it's called time regime anyway it'll be in the description box anyway um but yes thank you so much to the publisher for sending me this and i thought this was amazing uh great read for me this month okay next i have two books that i had to give back to the library Ugh, so i'm sorry i can't hold them physically <laughs> but uh the first one was uh, maybe you could scroll like this and i'll put like the photo over here anyway i don't know what side will be on though so anyway <laughs> um i read matrix by lauren groff which came out this year and i guess lauren groff is a famous author but i never heard of her sorry um it's kind of like lit fic contemporary fiction and it's basically about nuns, and it's specifically about Marie de France, um, who I don't, I didn't know who that was, but I guess she's a famous nun figure <laughs> in in the Christian religion. Sorry, guys, I I don't know, but yeah. So, if I had to describe this book, I would describe it as fan fiction about Marie de France, and I'm not even saying that in a bad way, like truly in a good way. Like I love the idea of that, and I specifically picked up this book because I wanted to read about nuns um unfortunately i it wasn't a bad book by any means it's very well written you know the usual like kind of elegant writing and we follow um our main character who's meant to be modeled off of marie de france and yeah we we basically follow her like through the beginning of her life to the end of her life and she lives this like long illustrious life um where she starts off you know an orphan and um well her mom passes away so she's an orphan and she is brought to this um convent and it's very like very rough conditions for her she doesn't want to be there and then she eventually gets to be like the leader of the convent and she basically builds like this very impressive nun empire <laughs> empire is not the right word but she becomes a very su successful like girl boss nun basically um so yeah so that uh the book literally follows her like to the beginning of her life to the end of her life where she dies sorry spoiler but she dies as everybody does um but yeah so i actually thought that was a drawback of the book i i actually really liked the character of marie and i wanted to get even more in her head but i thought that because the the author tried to tell her entire life from start to finish they there were like big gaps in the story where we jump like 20 30 years and i was like oh my god what is going on because we had just spent like 
a couple chapters describing like a couple weeks and then all of a sudden she'd be like oh it's been 20 years 30 years um so i thought that was weird i would have liked more time in the head of in the head of our narrator in the head of marie getting a sense of like her thoughts her ambitions which are very much like present throughout the book but i feel like there was just not enough depth and a main theme in this is that um, the author explores like queerness and she talks about basically like Marie is gay and she has not really relationships but encounters I guess with other nuns and there's like a section talking about like um, the attitudes towards queerness in the convent and I was really, really interested in that and that's why I picked up the book I was like oh my god I want to I want to read about gay nuns but it guys it wasn't even like a main part of the book like I feel like when people were talking about this book they were like marketing it as like gay nuns but that w it was like only in a couple chapters and then the rest of it was like Marie's life and I guess and then like she doesn't necessarily have like a relationship but she also has like this long-term like love of um this I, I don't know if she's a queen but ar aristocratic figure that she grows up with so I guess that's kind of like the main love umbrella, <laughs> like story arc throughout the, throughout the book. But again, like that wasn't developed. Like there was a lot of like anticipation of it. And when Marie like reaches her girl boss peak and she becomes like the head, like most powerful nun, she gets to actually like talk to her lover or not lover, but her love interest. And they have like this like correspondence back and forth. And I was like, oh my God, interesting. Like we can explore the relationship. We can explore how they're navigating like being gay in this kind of time period, you know, where it, you know, it wasn't even like a thing that was discussed. But then the author just kind of like started talking about other stuff. And then we, we just learned about like the end of Marie's life. Like, I don't know. I, I just wanted more from the book. I... I think the ideas were there but I just think there wasn't enough depth like it was a bit shallow like we needed more exploration of these themes we needed some more like emotional meat to like sink our teeth into I don't know that's a weird metaphor but you know what I mean like I don't know I'm interested to hear what people thought of this book because um I don't know maybe I just had a bad reaction to it but if you read this book let me know let me know what you thought I was really anticipating this book I was really looking forward to it but I don't know, it just fell a bit flat for me, unfortunately. Okay, I have another library book. Um, next I read another kind of novella, which was Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan, who is an Irish author. And I hadn't heard of her before, but I really like her writing now, and I'm excited to read her other works. I, th I think she has like a short story collection, um, and I really want to read that next. But yeah, so in this novella, she follows an Irish family in 1985, and she mainly follows, we, like our narrator that we follow is the father. I forgot his name, but he's the father. And he has like five or six daughters. Um, and he is a coal merchant. Like he like delivers the coal basically. And he oversees like a coal plant or something. Um, yes, and we basically follow him throughout the period of Christmas in 1995. And we also get a little bit of his backstory, which is an important part of the book. And I won't reveal it because it's such a short book anyway, but there is some interesting exploration of his past as we follow him in the present day of 1985. Um, I loved this character, like this father character. I'm like, we need more books like this where we're just follow following like an older man, like a dad in his head I don't know I never thought I'd say that like that we need more male narrators because I like notoriously get really irritated by narcissistic male leads but he was not he was not that at all like I really felt for him I felt for him as he tried to you know figure out how to be the best dad for his daughters and he tried to do the right thing and yeah and I just I really thought that like the main strength of this novella was this her creation of this dad character who again I can't remember his name and I don't have the book in front of me but anyway 
um, maybe I'll put it on the screen or something or leave it in the description box. But yes, yeah, so and another uh, strength of this novella was, was that you get like a really nice kind of cozy depiction of Christmas time. And I really want to reread this um, in December, like this coming December, even though it's like months away. I'm like already anticipating it. I, it's going to be a great Christmas read. Um, but yes, I really recommend this novella. I can't really say too much about why I liked it because there's kind of like an interesting twist and I I recommend that you check it out. Super short, uh, really immersive read and a great Christmas read if you're if you like doing like seasonal reads and want to add another kind of Christmassy read to your list. Okay, thank god I won the last book. I'm so sorry. Like I had such an underwhelming reading month but I have so many things to talk about. But I, the last book I read in March was Space Invaders by Nona Fernandez. She's a Chilean author and she has another book that I'm currently reading called The Twilight Zone. And I'm going to do a little Instagram post where I review these next to each other. And this is a much shorter one. It's basically a novella, but you might even call it like a long... Actually, it's not a novella. It's described as a novel, but... This book is so short. There's no way it's not a novella. And some of the pages um, are even like poems. Like they're very, very short little paragraphs. So hmm, interesting. Anyway, I would describe it as a novella. But this basically follows a group of children in like during the period of violence of um, the Pinochet regime in Chile. And we get like glimpses of their memories, of their childhood memories. So again, like if you like reading from the viewpoint of children, especially in the context of like political turbulence, political violence, this is definitely the book for you. Um, I was saying on my Instagram story, like I realized I've read so many books like this recently, in the, like in the past two years where it's children specifically as, and we see through their eyes, um, as they experience this, like, the very, like, politically, like, politically violent events. Sorry, I can't talk. Anyway, um, but yes, this was really good. I really enjoyed it. I don't have that much to say about it because, again, it's so short and some of the pages were just, like, poems. Um, maybe this would have been more interesting as a poetry collection. But, again, I can't, it's not really my place to say. But, yeah. The main strengths, I would say, are like the creative, inventive writing, and if you particularly enjoy like reading from the perspective of children, you would really like this. Uh, not that it's like a children's book by any means, but um, I think like, for me, I actually don't like child narrators because I think sometimes it can be very cringy, like very poorly done. Um, but in this case, I didn't think it was like, like that at all, and I, I thought that it was... Um, it actually gave a very interesting like perspective on the period, basically. And yes, yeah, so I'm really excited to um, finish her other book that I'm reading, and I'll be talking about that probably in my April books. Um, but yes, I I would really recommend this author. I didn't know about her, but um, shout out to Grey Wolf Press, who have published both of her books. And now I'm really excited that I've discovered her. And if you are interested in reading uh, about this period of history, in Chile, definitely check this out, like, 100%. This is the book for you. Okay, I finally got to the end of all of these books that I read in March and that were kind of underwhelming, but I would say the main highlights and the main recommendations, if you made it this far in the video, thank you so much, would be um, Voices in the Evening, um, Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan, Assembly by Natasha Brown, and, of course, anything by my man Primo Levi, who well, I will definitely be talking about more as I read through this giant collection. Um, but yes, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you got some recommendations from this, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!